Kerry Adams and you're listening to Kerry's Connoisseurs coming to you from Solid Gold Podcasts. Here we talk to the movers and shakers, the drinkers, the dreamers, and all the people who make it happen in the liquor and luxury industries from around the world. Today I have got Christian Kutzia in my studio. Well, not really in my studio, sort of on a screen in my studio. Christian, welcome to Kerry's Connoisseurs. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Kerry. It's a privilege being on the show and thanks for giving us the opportunity. It's pleasure's all mine. I'll tell everybody who you are. In fact, they probably know who you are already. Christian is the winemaker at Uwe Mera. And Uwe Mera is a winery that belongs to very good friends of mine, Toby and Jess. And... I think you've been the winemaker there for as long as I can remember. Matthew was there in and out briefly, but you've always been there, haven't you, Christian? Yeah, Gary, I, um, this year was my 11th vintage on the property. Um, mm. I started here um, in December 2012, and 2013 was my first vintage. Yeah, so I've been here for, for 11 long vintages time. now. So yeah. before we start talking about Toby and Jess and fast cars and beautiful vineyards and Uber Mira wine, we're going to talk about you because I don't know lots and lots about you. I know that you're a viticulturist and an enologist and I know that you make delicious wine, but where were you born? I was born in the Free State in Bloemfontein. Yeah, we'll forgive so, you for uh, that. <laughs> All good boys come from the free state, they say. <laughs> from Brooklyn, they say. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and? Um, yeah, so I was born in Bloemfontein. What made, you, what made you want to be a wine farmer when you came from Bloemfontein? I would have thought you'd be a cattle farmer or something like that. <laughs> hmm? Yeah. No, we still have a lot of family actually in the free state, Gary, but uh, we moved down when I was uh, quite young. And I was um, in primary school and also high school. I was down here in the Western Cape. We moved down when I was very small. Um, and yeah, so I was at school in Stellenbosch and obviously had lots of friends whose parents were in the industry. So we got exposed to, to the wine industry at a young age. And then in my back then when they still spoke about matric, in my matric year, Grade 12, they had uh, these new modules that they introduced to the school where, you know, you could do all sorts of things. And one of the modules was winemaking. And I remember back then it was presented at Middle Flay. And uh, so I, I chose to do that module. And it was very interesting to see the whole wine process. I've always loved nature and I also always loved science. So, um, I initially wanted actually to, to, to go into farming because my family, all of my family is into farming and my parents uh, weren't too excited about that. They said I must, <laughs> must, must think of a real career. <laughs> and, and, yeah. um, well, my career is drinking. You can imagine what my parents, <laughs> my parents' reaction was when I said what I wanted to be. <laughs> yeah. So I first actually wanted to do nature conservation. They said there's there's no way you've got to look after yourself and be able to you know provide a family one day. And then I said farming, and then they said no, we can't do farming. And then it all ended up that um, you know wine making was a very nice combination of um, of of farming, nature, and also science, and it just all worked out really well at the end. Yeah. It's very genteel, isn't it? It's not like sticking your hand up animals, what's it, and yeah, exactly. milking cows exactly. at three in the morning. And, you know, it's, it's, it's much more yeah. gentle than that, isn't it? Uh, no, that's, that is for sure. But it's hard work. I mean, uh, we still have long hours on harvest, so uh, you do get your you hands dirty. You all say that. You work hard for one month of the year, Christian. I know that. That's half the story. <laughs> we, we, we travel most of the time, work a lot over weekends, entertaining yeah, and guests. And you, you, <laughs> probably fish about in Porsches and what have you. I know, I know what you do. <laughs> so, you went to Altenburg and you studied viticulture and enology. You became a winemaker and a very yes. good one at that. And 
you went and worked with Graham Beck, and then I think you went yeah. to Champagne. Yes. Are you yeah. in love? Are you a champagne file? Do you love champagne best out of everything? Uh, not best out of everything, but I absolutely love it. Um, so I was fortunate enough for Peter Ferreira back then to arrange a harvest for me in Champagne, a small little town called Boozy, uh, which is oh, one of Boozy's I think. Boozy's gorgeous. Little, yeah. So we they, I think one of. <laughs> I think they're one of 11 uh, villages that's classified Grand Cru for both Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And I worked with the Lamar family there, a fantastic family, and just had a very, uh, really wonderful experience working with them. And, you know, the French are really passionate about what they do. So um, I do love Bubbly, um, definitely. Um, I, I remember, Who doesn't? you know, yeah, yeah. Who doesn't like bubbly? I mean, what can you, have you ever met anyone who doesn't like? In fact, I think I have met a few people who don't like bubbly, but they, they're not my friends anymore. They didn't stay around for long. You have to love bubbly. It's just gorgeous stuff. Yeah, it's a special product. And um, no, so um, I, um, I, I, I wanted to make bubbly only when I started off, but um, obviously there's a bit more to the wine world than just bubbly. Um, some people might differ, but um, I um, I really like the product. It's very technical, but also a wonderful product. You know, you, you get all sorts of styles, and I really like uh, sparkling wine a lot. Mm. So you came yeah. back from you came back from France, and I think you worked for the KWV for a bit. I think I remember. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so after after um, Champagne, I actually went over to Germany. I have a friend there that's got a small winery in in the Falls, in a small town called Eden Coven. I came back, and then um, I um, I did a vintage at Nuremberg. Actually, um, I worked back then with Tariru Masayiti, who was the white wine maker at the stage. Well, Helen Pinar, that's now at Hermanus Petersfontein, mm. uh, arranged the job for me. We were good friends. Um, he was a red wine maker back then at Niederberg. And then uh, I did the vintage of Niederberg. And then just after Niederberg, I started with KWV um, as an assistant winemaker. I uh, was later promoted to winemaker. And um, I was there for almost three years at KWV. Yeah. And making some delicious wine. I chatted with Izel the other day. And in fact, yes. I've spoken to everybody at the KWV during the last sort of year. And I love what they're doing. You know, that I, I think that you had quite a lot to do with the mentors range when you were there. It's one of my favorite labels in South Africa, that KWV Mentors, delicious wine, unsung hero of the industry. It's really lovely. Yeah. No, they, they, they make really, really world-class wines, yeah. um, especially the mentors, but also the other range, you know, all the other ranges they have mm. in terms of value for money. It's just unbelievable. In the meantime, Toby is going to kill me because I'm interviewing you for Uva Mira and I'm sitting talking about the KWV <laughs> and how much I love the mentors. <laughs> so let's get to Uva Mira. Uva Mira yes. is a beautiful, it's, it's, it's not a huge farm, but it's 130 odd hectares, I think, That's great, and yeah. it, it's sort of high up on the hill, isn't it? It's high up yeah. on the hill in Stellenbosch, so your altitude, some of your vines are around about 550, 600 feet above sea level, which is high for, for South African vineyards, and I remember driving in, and it's all immaculate, as it would be with Mr. Fenter. And mm-hmm. there's olive groves and there's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful little farm. It really, really, really is. And I don't think that a lot of the, of the 130 odd hectares is actually under vine, unless you've planted a lot more since I was there last. It was only a tiny percentage that was actually under vine. Am I correct? Yes. So um, the property itself, um, you correct, uh, Carrie is, is, you know, we, we situated between 250 and 620 meters mm. above sea level, only nine kilometers from the Atlantic Ocean as the crow flies. So very much influenced by altitude and proximity to the ocean. Yeah. Our pre- prevailing Which really winds. does, it really does play a large part in what ends up in the bottle. Because if we, if we go by 
I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Winkler Index. I think that your farm and the farms on that sort of ridge, they sort of, um, they produce wine that is about as similar to what you might get in Bordeaux as possible. So because yeah. of the because of the geography of the farm, you know. So your wines are absolutely. You have the ability to make extremely nice wine on that farm. Yes, very fortunate to to work with this property. It's a very special property, mm. um, and obviously, you know, the way we locate it, we on a little ridge here. So we've got two valleys on either side, and then the mountain mm. at the top. So. Uh, although we're 130 hectares, you, you can't plant the, you know, the full 130 hectares of vineyards just because of the way that the, the, the property lies with valleys and mountain, you know, around us. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've planted quite a lot of vineyards in the last few years. Um, the, since I've been here, we've probably planted about 15 hectares. Um, but we've also uprooted quite a lot of vineyards because we're busy with a program to get the property virus free from virus. Oh, okay, that's um, good. Yeah, so we've worked with the same uh, Professor Gerard Peterson that actually got Vergelegen clean, which is the first property in the world to be virus free. Um, mm. So he's really the guru when it comes to a leaf roll virus in the world. And he's South African, now living in Stellenbosch. So he's, he's fully involved in the property. His son actually does all the monitoring for us. We're giving Uwe a heart transplant. Like Chris heart Barnum transplant. Was <laughs> he, was the first, he was the first heart transplant. This is the first heart transplant in the, in the winelands, which is brilliant. Yes, yes. And um, yeah, it's a very exciting uh, to, to, to be involved in this planting uh, program of ours. Yeah. So, let's talk to everybody. Uva Mira means wonderful grape in Latin. Cor correct, yes. Is 100%. it wonderful grape? Yeah. The wonderful grape, yeah. So, Uva, Uva is, is, is grape and then Mira is wonderful or miraculous. So, it translates to the wonderful grape. Yes. And then your opinion on that property, which is the most wonderful grape? The, the the most wonderful grapes on the property. You can say you're not going to get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to see big no, the, the, the property, the property has always been known for Chardonnay, um, but um, people always think of Uva Mira as Chardonnay. But it's not the only thing that it does great. You know, we also make world class Bordeaux varietals, uh, more specifically Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm. So th th those three varieties are probably the varieties with the biggest potential on this property. And when I say the biggest potential, I'm talking about, you know, competing with the best in the world at any price point. Um, we I also have quite... Have... Sorry, carry on. No worries. We also have a, quite a significant planting of Shiraz, and we do that really well um, as well in terms of quality. But um, Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon is probably the varieties that will shoot the lights out when we go on to the international stage. I uh, think you've just released your Cab Frac, hey? You've just released a new vintage. Or what, what did I read somewhere about Cabernet Franc from Uber Mira? Yeah, so, uh, Carrie, we've... In 2013, we launched this new range of wines. Um, and um, that... We, we produced a single right or Cab Franc since the start, actually, which is called the Dance Cabernet Franc. Mm. And that's from a single vineyard. Then we also have our top red wine, which is called the OTV, which is Cap Frank based. Um, yes. um, and that's also been produced since 2013. And those two wines have done really exceptionally well for us on an international stage. And then we are about to release in the next week uh, this wine called the Mira um, Cabernet Franc yes. 2021 vintage. So that will now... Um, expand you know the Cabernet Franc sort of dominated wines to three wines in our portfolio which I show I think show people that there is a focus of Cabernet Franc on this property yes. and there's very few places that Cap Franc does really well it's a difficult right to get uh -huh. right um, but the potential here up on the Helderberg where we located is just unbelievable um, and um, so that's why we, we've expanded the, the sort of Cap Frank um, wines in our range. Mm, mm. 
So you've obviously got a, um, a dominant planting of Cabernet Franc. You're more, more Cab Franc on the farm than anything else, or are you still Chardonnay heavy? So no, we so Cabernet Franc makes up a third of our red wine planting. So we're actually a third Cab Franc, a third Cab Sav, and then a third Shiraz. Um, but uh, there's only certain pockets that Cabernet Franc can really do well. So you have to pick those pockets and just plant them. For us, the instruction from the the owners were to make the best wine we possibly can. So we do everything possible in our ability to make sure that every planting is best for that specific site. So that's why we haven't gone and just planted Cabernet Franc all across the property because we yeah, think it does can't. well. Yeah, you have to, to make sure where, where what is um, you know going to be best. Tell me, once upon a time, you made a wine called Singerwing. Correct. Where is Singerwing? We still produce the Singerwing Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so Singerwing um, is a... Wasn't that for actually... Granny? Was that not for Jess's mum or... <laughs> So it's a beautiful story. It's a it's a, it's a true story actually. So um, Mr. Fenter's parents um, had this uh, term of endearment, nicknamed for each other, which they called each other my singer wing. Um, yeah, until this very day, um, none of the children actually knows why they called each other my singer wing. But then on their uh, fifth twenty fifth wedding anniversary. Uh, Mr. Fenter's father wrote his mother a poem, which um, is called My Singer Wing. And um, it's, um, he was a chartered accountant, and um, we've shown this poem to, to, to a lot of guests on the property. And it's really quite amazing for, it's, a, it's an amazing poem. So for a chartered accountant to write this amazing story? poem. Is it a love story? It's a love from story, a chartered yeah. Accountant? My goodness. 100%. Yeah. There's and hope. it's really, There's really beautiful. Hope on planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, it's, a, it's a lovely, lovely poem. So every bottle actually comes with this little tag with the poem on it. And um, yeah, it touched a lot of hearts. For and, sure. you're still, and you're still making the singer wing? We do. So it's the singer wing comes from. Two specific pockets within two different vineyards higher up on the property close to our manor house mm -hmm. and um, that's produced in small quantities so it's only two and a half thousand bottles three thousand bottles maybe yes. of that wine and um, yeah so it is a wine that sells out quite quickly and quite a big following on it so yeah that's why you it's not available everywhere i loved it <laughs> i'm not a huge i'm not a huge Samuel Blanc fan but I remember yes. when it was first released, I absolutely loved it, and I fell in love with the story because I'm a, I'm a completely and utterly ridiculously hopeless romantic, and I remembered <laughs> something about that story, and I thought, how absolutely gorgeous for somebody to, to, first of all, one wonders, sing a wing, I mean, one does wonder what that might be, but as you say, it was an accountant who in amongst his grey shoes and his mundane head, came up with a love letter, which in itself was quite, um, was quite endearing. And then for Toby to actually honour all of that in a bottle and make a beautiful label for, for them as well. It's a lovely story. And I, th I think it just underscores my, um, my theory always, that you could put methylated spirits into a bottle. And a beautiful story on the label, and you'll sell it all. They'll drink it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Everything needs, just needs a lovely story, doesn't it? That's true. That's true. So, but fortunately, it's not it's not methylated spirits. It's actually jolly delicious wine. The Chardonnay. Tell me your vinification for the Chard. You are you going the route of all South African wineries, by the looks of things at this stage of the game, and buying eggs and fudras and this and that and what, how are you making your Chardonnay? So we, we've uh, kept it a bit more traditional, if you want to call it. We don't use any um, fudras, we don't use any concrete eggs or clay and foras or any of these mm. um, new, um, well, new, you can call it new, it's very old technology. I was going to say... Uh, 
Yes. Regenerating so, ideas. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like to have a scientific approach to things, Kerry, uh, and I like to understand why things work. I've never understood concrete eggs or amphoras, you know, with the whole permeability of oxygen through the clay or the concrete. If I want mm. to be specific and I want to have micro-oxygenation in my wine, I buy a micro-oxygenation machine and I can dose the exact <laughs> amount of oxygen into the to the vessel and, um, you know, have the same effect. I've never understood the theory behind all of this. Uh, it is very romantic and it probably adds to the story. I was going to say, you could have been story. an accountant, Christian. You could have been an accountant. Uh, so we, uh, I believe in consistency and we, we use French oak barrels on all our yeah. Chardonnays. All of it goes into barrel. Um, we've got a very good relationship with a couple of Coopers and we've, you know, really focused on getting the right oak over, over the years. And I think that we we are you know as close as possible to where we've been in the past to to where we want to be in terms stylistically of the Chardonnay. So yeah, um, not any plans soon to to to, to acquire any of those. And why should you? <laughs> because when you've got a Christmas cake recipe that works, don't change it. Just keep yes. using the same recipe. Your your Chardonnay is world class. It's gorgeous. You don't bottle yeah. huge amounts of it either, though, do you? So the, we, we've got three uh, Chardonnays, different Chardonnays in our range now. Uh, the first is called the Mira Chardonnay. Uh, it's our first offering, very lightly oaked. Uh, that's about, you know, 20 to 30% new oak. We make about 20 to 25,000 bottles of that every year. And then the two top uh, tier Chardonnay is called the Single Tree and the Icon Chardonnay. Yes. That comes from a, a registered single vineyard, and that's small production. We're talking two and a half, three thousand bottles of each. Uh, so those those are smaller productions. Um, but um, yeah, we we would like to grow it because we have the potential to grow, and it just takes time with everything like everything else in the industry to to so expand. So if I was, if I were to say to my listeners and my readers and my and my people who wait to hear stories from people like you what what do you think your nicest wine is from Uvamira or is that unfair for me personally the the nicest white wine uh, I like the Icon Chardonnay is our top top white wine on the red wine uh, the OGV um, is the, a Bordeaux style blend. Is for me the the Cap Franc based Bordeaux style blend, mm. which is a, is a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc. So it depends on if we're talking white or red. Those two are my personal favorites. You know, a lot of other people uh, might find the single varietal Cabernet Franc very interesting, which I also absolutely love. Um, and uh, but it's not very not everybody likes Cap Frank, although it's a variety that you know I think trending upwards all the way, um, and I think it will become a lot more popular, especially with global warming going forward. It's a variety that I think will definitely um, you know sort of um, appeal to a lot of people uh, in the future. I think, Kevin A. Frank, you're sort of gathering quite a lot of impetus here. And I think that South Africa can make lovely ones. I'll never forget when I first tasted the Cabernet A. Frank that came off um, Cordoba. Remember Great, little yeah. Cordoba, that little uh, wine? When I first came back yeah. from England, I was working for Anglo-American farms. And Fergelechen was sort of on the back side of Cordoba. And we went for a tasting one evening. at Chris Keat was... Chris Keat was the winemaker at the time. Yes, yes. And some of us girls went over the hill and we went down and were completely and utterly charmed by the gorgeous Chris Keat with his huge blue eyes and he gave us loads of stuff to drink in that beautiful little tasting room. And I remember being so bowled over by the quality of the Cabernet Franc that came off Cordoba, which went into that famous crescendo blend, which of course Skulk Willem is now making. Um, it's now 100%. renamed Tybos, and he's making that beautiful crescendo, well, Tybos red blend, and that's predominantly Cabernet Franc. How far away are you from that little strip of Cab Franc that ran through Morganster and the back end of Fergelechen, and I suppose 
Where's Brevet Rot? Miles away from there. I've got a thing that the grape variety should be planted in the same sort of space because there's obviously the right sort of soil there. But you know where Via Crescendo, are you? Yeah, we... I mean, we, you know where we are Cordoba. We are. We're actually very close to Cordoba. So hey. there's, there's one property between us and them. Oh, well, um, there you are then. That's why you planted... Yeah. So that's why you got such a nice cap, Frank. Yes. So, yeah. So this, this Helderberg really does well with Cabernet Franc, you know. Mm. And um, I think... Um, You'll see more and more Cap Francs, and also Alter. You know, Alter's also got a lot of Cap Franc actually in the Alter Rouge. Who's making the uh, wine at Alter now? Is he Berthe van, It's Berthe van der Westeisen. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, yeah, very okay. good winemaker, and um, he's, he's in charge there now. I was chatting to Tim Atkin the other day on a thing like this, and his wine find of his report was was Alter Rouge. Mm. He named it as his find of the year, and I went and bought a bottle from the spa shop or something the other day to have a taste of it, and it was yes. absolutely delicious. I'd forgotten about Alto Rouge. You know, we all tend to forget about Alto Rouge. Anyway, we digress. Yeah. We're talking about Uva Mera. <laughs> Anything new coming out of Uva Mera that we need to know about? Yeah, so um, we obviously have this Mira Cabernet Franc, uh, 2021 vintage yes. that's about to be launched in, a, in about a week's time. And yeah, Gary, we've, we've, last year we've planted new vineyards, new Chardo vineyards, new Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, mm. We've got a very exciting wine that will be launched next year, which I can't say too much about oh, at this come stage. Come on, come on, tell us a tease, a snippet. Is it white or red? Well, it's a red wine that will probably be the most expensive wine in South Africa. Oh, stop it. Uh, yes. Tell Toby, uh, we're busy trying to save up to buy a new Porsche. If the wine is too expensive, we can't buy the Porsche. We can buy one or the other, <laughs> not both. The, the bottle of wine will bring you more joy. He's going to kill me for this. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I love wine, but I love my Porsche too. <laughs> No, it's a, it's an investment wine, um, so it will be something that you you can invest in as well. Um, oh, wow. So that's a very exciting project that we're busy with, um, and um, yeah, so new vintages will be about to release with the Chardonnays. Uh, the icon and the single tree will soon move over to the twenty one vintages. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of new wines coming out, new vintages. And uh, lots of planting and we can, on the problem. We can buy direct from you. We can buy online. We'll tell everybody to get hold of Pearl. Pearl is one of my darling girls in Johannesburg. And she looks yes. after you in Johannesburg. So we'll tell everybody how and where and what and why they can get hold of here. I was about to ask you something very important. Yes. And it slipped this mind of mine. But in any event, we'll move on. If I was to make, if I was to make, today's my birthday. Congratulations. And, yes. And if I was to make, <laughs> thank you, a special dinner to drink with a bottle of your Bordeaux blend, what would you cook? What should I cook? Sure. So with the Bordeaux blend, so Cabernet Franc based blend is really um, an elegant uh, style of Bordeaux. Uh, um, I would say, obviously, always red meat goes really well with, with Bordeaux-style wines. Um, I, I can recommend, you know, something like a ribeye um, steak with it, which I really like. Um, so, I, something like a ribeye would really complement the wine really well. Um, yeah, so a good old steak. <laughs> <laughs> I love you boys. you real, real, real boys. There's nothing wrong with a bottle of gorgeous red wine. And a well-cooked ribeye steak. Christian, mm. you are a gorgeous boy. Your wine is delicious. Thank you very, very much for joining me. We will make sure that we try and spread the word far and wide as to how lovely your wines are. Give my love to everybody on the farm and thank you for being with me. Thank you, Gary. Enjoy your birthday and um, I hope you have uh, big celebrations planned this evening. <laughs> I don't really. I don't really. I'm going <laughs> to celebrate with two Scotty dogs. All right, we'll, we'll have a glass of wine with you. Have one for me. <laughs> yeah, okay. We'll have one. Thanks, Thank you Gary. very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. 
another production from Solid Gold Podcasts.